Good morning. Welcome to Christ the Way Seventh Day Adventist Church. If you're a visitor here today, we want to extend to you a very special welcome. And if you're new, very special welcome to you as well. We are so glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. To those of you online, uh, welcome to our church service. We hope that you will be blessed today and that you will continue joining us week after week. What a beautiful rain we had this morning. God is so good. Uh, that was just what we needed. And um, we just want to give God thanks and praise for a beautiful, beautiful Sabbath morning. So again, welcome to our church. We're glad that you're here. If you have your bulletins, a few announcements they'd like to bring to your attention. First one is a little insert, uh, a seminar that will be taking place here September 3rd. Mark that in your calendar and come and learn how to remain pure before and after marriage. Also, there's some announcements in the bulletin I just want to bring to your attention as well. Our series continues this evening at 6, Living Like Jesus. And um, there's also a meeting at 5 p.m. this afternoon for the prison worship uh, individuals. Uh, just get the details from the bulletin. If you're involved in praise and worship, we wanted to be here promptly at five because we only have one hour before our series continues. So plan to be here on time. Church directory, uh, get your pictures taken and help Cindy get that together. Um, if you have a child that you would like to enroll in a Christian school, Coralwood is taken registrations right now. You could just go online and register there or contact them in person. It's a, a blessing to have a Christian education, in, especially in the times in which we are living. So if you know of someone or you have a child interested in being there, do that as well. Again, welcome to our church. We know that God is going to bless us today because he has promised that wherever we come together, be it two or three of us, if we come together in his name, he's going to be there to bless. For a call to worship today, I want to read from, far, from Psalms 57, a psalm of David. He wrote this while he was fleeing Saul. And here's what he says in Psalms 57. I'll be reading from verse 7. It says, My heart is steadfast. O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake my glory, awake lute and harp. I will awake the dawn. I will praise you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Today we come to praise and to worship the eternal God, our heavenly Father. I'd like to invite you now to stand as we have our opening prayer. Father God, we're so grateful for your many, many blessings. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the beautiful weather we are enjoying. For a beautiful Sabbath day, we give you thanks and praise. For the ability to worship in freedom, we give you thanks. You take care of us day by day. You provide for all our needs. And today we come with grateful hearts to worship and to praise your holy name. We thank you for Jesus and for forgiveness, for your grace that's so abundant and so free. We thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct us. Father, today we want to pause and think for a moment of those of our church family and others who might be going through difficult times. We know that life is not always easy and there are challenges we have to deal with, but we know that you are God that cares for each one of us. So minister to their needs now according to your plans for their life. 
bring peace and comfort and assurance to each one. We pray for forgiveness where we have failed you, where we have doubted your word. And we pray for your spirit's guidance to help us to live according to your plans for us. We know that your coming is soon and we want to be ready. We know that uh, you have a better life for us. We are, we are tired of seeing the suffering around us every day. Destruction on every hand, pain, suffering, sickness. Please come, Father, and um, help us to be faithful until that day. We give you thanks and praise because of who you are and that the God that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I don't think you heard me very well, so I'm going to try that again. Thank you, Marley. Good morning, everyone. And a happy Sabbath to you. You know, for the last two weeks, I wasn't well. And uh, I had to join into the service online. Uh, it's, it's good that I had the opportunity to do so. But this is a thousand times better. Being here with you, um, seeing your faces, seeing the smiles. Uh, a few persons greeted me outside. And I felt as though I was connected again. Um, so it's awesome to be here with you. And for the online, the persons joining us online, as great as it is that you're here with us, I promise you, if you come here, if you can, it's going to be better. But this morning, we're here to sing. Amen? Um, there's a song that says, come Christians, join to sing. We're all Christians because we're here. So that part is settled. Now I want to see if you're going to join me in singing as we go into our prison worship for this morning. And I pray that you'll be blessed as we share together on this blessed Sabbath day. Let's go. Come Christians, join to sing. Alleluia, amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Alleluia, amen. Let all with heart and voice before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Come lift your hearts on high. Alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend. His love shall never end. Alleluia, amen. Praise ye or Christ. Uh, let me hear you. Beautiful life shall not, life shall not end the strain. Alleluia, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness we'll adore. Singing for with everything you have, alleluia. Alleluia, amen. Praise the Lord. You'd make a great choir. You follow directions really well. You respond. That's awesome. Uh, now we're going to go to number 187. Uh, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. One of the, the songs I really love, and I only recently learned this, this tune of it. I didn't even appreciate that there are multiple tunes for this song. But I, I love this one. And I pray that we will be, you'll enjoy it as much as I've been enjoying it since I learned it. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may 
fail me, foes assail me, my Savior makes me whole. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength in weakness, let me hide myself in Him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, He my strength, my victory wins. Alleluia, what a Savior! Alleluia, what a friend! Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a help in sorrow while the billows o'er me roll. Even when my heart is breaking, He, my comfort, helps my soul. Alleluia, what a Savior! Alleluia, what a friend! Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, I do now adore Him more than all in Him I find. He hath granted me forgiveness. I am His and He is mine. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend. Keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. It's beautiful. I like the way it, it sways. It's, it's, it's lovely. Um, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Another beautiful song that uh, I trust we, we all know. I hope we know it, but by the time you get the tune together, if you don't, please join in and sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the one he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. 
There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, there in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, nor fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final death. Breath, sorry. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. What a sentiment. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Our final song this morning as we prepare for the rest of our worship service is Open Our Eyes, We Want to See Jesus. This, of course, is a prayer. And I'm hoping that you will pray it with me as we sing and that we will really have our hearts opened to the presence and the, the, the message that Jesus is trying to communicate to us today. Let us open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Let's sing that song one more time and really sing it as, you, as though you mean it. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. We want to see, to reach out and touch him. To reach out and touch Him And say that we love Him Open our ears, Lord And help us to listen Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Praise the Lord. Be blessed. Thank you. Good morning again. And I know that uh, some others have come in, so welcome. We're glad that you're here. It's time for offering. You know, God blesses us every day. The Bible tells us that not even one sparrow falls to the ground when he's not aware. How much more is he interested in you and me and our welfare? So let's be faithful as we return our tithes and offerings. The offering today is for a church family budget. Um, church family budget, the funds we use to provide programming for our church, for our children, for the community. This summer, we, we had the privilege of doing a Canada 
Canada Day pancake breakfast. We had a vacation Bible school. Those are some of the things that our church family budget funds. So let's be generous as we return our tithes and our offerings. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise that you're always aware of our needs and that you provide for all our needs according to your richness and glory. Help us to always have grateful hearts for what you have given to us. And as we return our gifts to you today, may you bless them and may they be used to share your love with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for a children's story, and children, I have a little bit of bad news. Uh, Sister Roma had a little emergency, and she couldn't be here today. So we have no in-person children's story, but we're going to have you a story from Sister Shanique Brown. She volunteered to do a little video story. So just stay in your seats and enjoy the children's story. Hello boys and girls, the title of our story today is Taking Care of God's Special Temple. Today's memory verse is from 1 Corinthians 3 verses 16 to 17 which says, You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God and God himself is present in you. No one will get by with destroying God's temple. You can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred and you, remember, are the temple. The message for today is, I will take care of my body. I will take care of God's temple. Have you ever been tempted to eat something that you knew was bad for you? Or, have you ever been asked to do something that you knew was wrong before? That is exactly what happened to Daniel and his friends. A long time ago, there was a king. The king's name was King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't happy with just his own kingdom. He wanted more and more. Do you know what he did? He sent his mighty army to Jerusalem to capture that city. After he captured the city, he took some of the young men to become servants in his palace. One of the young men taken captive was Daniel. Daniel also had three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were all taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. They had to leave their city and all of their friends and families, and they were all so sad. It was a very long trip to Babylon. When Daniel and his friends finally got to Babylon, they were put through special training to become good servants. They were going to be trained for three years 
before they could work in the palace. Every day, they were given certain foods to eat, but there was a big problem. The food they were given to eat was food that God had told them specifically not to eat. What were they to do? They loved God and wanted to serve God. So Daniel asked if they could be given only vegetables and water and other healthy foods to eat. The person in charge of them did not want to do this. He was afraid that Daniel and his friends would become weak. But Daniel taught him into letting them eat only vegetables and to drink water for 10 days to see how they did. What do you think happened? How do you think Daniel and his friends looked at the end of the 10 days? Guess what? At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked better than anyone else. They had done the right thing by doing what God wanted and God had taken care of them. For the rest of their training, they ate only the food that God wanted them to eat. And at the end of the training, they were the strongest and wisest men of all. Daniel and his friends did what was right, even though they were being held against their will. They decided to take care of their bodies which is the temple of God, and you can do it too. In the case of Daniel and his friends, they decided against eating foods that God told them not to eat. But did you know that taking care of our bodies, which is God's temple, does not only include eating nutritious meals? No. It also involves getting enough sleep, my favorite, exercising such as running, skipping, and walking. It also includes practicing good hygiene like washing our hands, bathing, and even brushing and flossing our teeth. And so, boys and girls, let us be like Daniel and his friends and try our very best to take care of God's temple by taking care of our bodies. The end. Bye. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Please stand for the scripture reading. The scripture is taken from Colossians chapter 3, 16 to 17. Let the message about Christ live amongst you like a rich treasure. Teach and correct one another wisely. Teach one another by singing psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with sing to God with thanks in your heart. Do everything you say or do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Always give thanks to God the Father. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated.
There's a call going out across the land in every nation. A call whose wear allegiance to the cross of Christ. A call to true humility to give our lives responsibly to deepen our devotion to the cross at any price. Let us then be sober, moving only in the spirit. As aliens and strangers in a hostile land, the message we're proclaiming is repentance and forgiveness, the offer of salvation to the dying race of man. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world. The mission still the same. As a candle is consumed by the passion of a flame, spilling light unsparingly throughout a darkened room, let us burn then our service flaming bright will radiate his passions and blaze with holy light to love the lord our god is the heartbeat of our mission the spring from which our service overflows Across the street or around the world, the mission still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, thank you so very much, Brother Randall, for blessing our hearts with such a beautiful, powerful musical rendition. Amen? Amen. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission. That is our purpose. Our purpose 
is to love God and to love God's people. And guess what? Last time I checked, God's people are all over this world. Various nations, various races, various religions, amen? God is indeed the creator of heaven and of earth. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? If you're happy and you know it, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's so good to see your faces this morning when I woke up and I realized that it was going to be a cloudy and a rainy day. I wondered whether anybody would be here. But it's good to see your faces. Um, if I were here alone, I probably would have still have to preach the camera, but it's not the same. Amen? God bless you. I'm seeing some new faces um, in here this morning. If you, I, I want you to just take some time to look to your left, look to your right, look behind you. And if you see anyone who is new, if they're close to you, give them a handshake, give them a hug. If they're far away, blow them a kiss. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. We, um, we, we are continuing uh, our series today. We are continuing our series today. Um, is this monitor working by any chance? This monitor here? We are continuing our series today um, on living like Jesus. Living like Jesus. And um, last Sabbath, we, we, we took time to reflect on how to connect with individuals of different religions. We looked at some of the main religions in the world and how we can be intentional about building bridges as opposed to walls. At the end of the day, um, a lot of the religions that we think we, we disagree with, that we criticize, if we take time to get to know these individuals, you'll, we'll, we'll recognize that they have similar values, similar hopes, similar dreams, similar aspirations. And I think God has allowed us to live within the reality of a diverse world, not for us to compete against each other, but for us to complete each other as we, as we come together. And so we are continuing uh, with this theme today, and I want to look at the subject, becoming an attractive Christian. Becoming an attractive Christian. That's right. I like to see that. Praise the Lord. And um, I'm not sure if somebody can help me. If this monitor is working, I would like for it to be on. If not, that's fine. Um, becoming an attractive Christian. Um, I want to thank Sammy for so eloquently and so bravely reading our scripture reading. God bless you. Um, it's so good to see when children stand here and they, and they minister with their various gifts, talents, and abilities. And so for our scripture reading, I want to look at um, a broader context. Uh, we read for our scripture reading uh, Colossians 3, 16 and 17, but I want to read a few verses before in order for us to get some greater perspective and enlightenment on this subject, becoming an attractive Christian. But before we turn to the word, we're going to turn to Colossians 3. And um, normally, when I, when I prepare to preach a sermon, the first thing I do before I consult anything else, I go straight to the Word and I read the passage in various translations, various translations, because um, sometimes it's very difficult to um, translate um, a passage from one language to another language without missing out some of the nuances of that particular language. And we know the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, some parts of Aramaic. And so to translate the Bible to English is not a very simple or very easy task. So sometimes I have to consult various translations to see which one comes closer to the original. And um, last Sabbath, I used the King James Version. This Sabbath today, I'm using... Um, another translation called the NLT, which is a very simple translation, the New Living Translation, but in many cases, it is very true to, to the original language. 
So in a little while, we will have the passage superimposed upon the screen. Um, you can feel free to follow on the screen, on the big screen, or feel free to follow in your own Bible and compare and contrast as we go along. Before we turn to the Word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to read your Word today, to reflect on your Word today, to study your Word today. Father, as we open up your Word, we pray that you may open up the eyes of our understanding. Speak the peace, speak the power, speak the anointing, speak the glory of your Word into our lives, into our hearts, we pray and as a result, may we experience deliverance. May we experience a revival of hope. May we experience, dear Father, renewal and victory in your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Becoming an attractive Christian. Let's, let's turn to uh, the book of Colossians. Colossians. And um, I'm pressing the clicker, and it's showing a battery that is, that is dead, blinking, blink, blink, blink. So I think that means that the battery is dead. So um, Paul, can you help me while we change the battery? Um, Colossians, let's go to Colossians. And if we can just um, change the, the slide for me, please. Yeah, this is blinking here. Um, let's get the slide changed. If we just hit forward, amen. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3 from verse 10. Let's read together, everybody. It says, put on your what? Your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives where? In all of us. Verse 12, verse 12. Verse 12, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must do what? Clothe yourselves with tender hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make what? Allowance for each other's faults. Lord have mercy. That's, that's, that's easier to read than to do. Make allowance for each other's faults and do what? Forgive some people. Forgive what? Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Verse 14, verse 14. Above all, clothe yourselves. Let's go back to verse 14. Above all, clothe yourselves with what? Love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule where? In your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. The last two verses, verses 16 and 17. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do, or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's move forward one slide. Praise the Lord. Colossians 3, which we just read, begins, I know I didn't read from the beginning, but it it begins in verse 1, Colossians 3 verse 1, it begins with a conditional clause. And this conditional clause in Colossians 3 verse 1 is founded upon the verification of a past reality. And it points to the expected consequence 
of such a reality. So if you go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, you'll realize it begins with a conditional clause, and this conditional clause is founded upon the verification of a past reality, and it points to the expected consequence of such. You know, I'm going to read verse 1 for you in a second. I want you to know that as I read verse 1, um, I thought about this verse for a while, and I came to uh, one conclusion, and the conclusion I came to is this. Every privilege has a corresponding reality, or rather, every privilege has a corresponding responsibility. So every privilege you have has a corresponding responsibility. Every privilege comes with it a responsibility. You can think of the privilege as a call. You can think about the privilege that God gives you as calls from God. I think I lost some sound here in the monitor. And so if the privilege is the call, the corresponding responsibility to the privilege is your response. Have you ever noticed what the root word of responsibility is? What do you think the root word is? Response. Response. It is, it is your response to the call, your response to the privilege. So let's check out uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Check it out. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, the King James Version says, if then you have been raised, that's a conditional clause, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, that is the privilege. Now, what is the responsibility? Set your sights on where? realities in heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And so every privilege has a corresponding responsibility. Let me break it down. To be an adult, that's a privilege that carries with it the corresponding responsibility of being resourceful, being dependable, being productive, to be, to be a leader, that's, that's a, a privilege that carries with it the corresponding responsibility of being insightful, being self-controlled, magnanimous, uh, being adaptable, empowered, and empowering. To be a student, that's a privilege that carries with it the responsibility of being teachable, being attentive, being committed, being studious. To be a husband, that is a privilege that carries with it the responsibility of being loving, being affirming, being caring, being self-sacrificing and tactful. Husband and wife were laying in bed early one morning and the wife apparently had a restless night. And she got up and she saw the husband snoring away. And so she took her elbow and she just hit him in his chest. She's like, honey, out of the blue. You know, sometimes women do some interesting things. Out of the blue. Honey, why do you no longer carry me up the stairs the same way you carried me up the stairs on our wedding day? Now, now, now my friends, they've been married now for 15 years. 15 years. And she hit him in his chest. Why do you no longer carry me in your arms up to the bedroom like you did on our wedding day? Don't you love me anymore? The husband, I mean, between sleep and wake, he said, baby, a lot has changed since that day. Wrong response. She hit him again. What are you saying? Do you mean that I'm, I've gained weight? Do you mean I'm now fat? Well, my friends, <laughs> the husband said, oh, no, sweetheart. Not at all. Not at all. It's just that since then, I've gotten weaker. <laughs> being a husband means, means being tactful, being tactful. And of course, by the way, nowadays, you don't use the word fat. That is politically incorrect, and that is insulting. Um, you need to find new ways of saying the same thing. So you can probably say, you know, honey, you have, you have progressed horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know that. I mean, ladies, does that sound better? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Every, every privilege has a corresponding responsibility. The privilege of salvation, even the privilege of salvation, comes with the corresponding responsibility of accessing, assimilating, and administering the glory of God. So when God calls us into his saving grace, when God calls us into his power, when God calls us into his great salvation, understand this, that is a privilege, but it has a corresponding responsibility of accessing God's glory. That means every single day we ought to be intentional about placing ourselves in the position and in the space where we can become covered with the glory of God. And similarly, we ought to be careful about avoiding certain realities that can place a damper on the glory. Accessing is not only about accessing, it's also about assimilating, taking time to receive it, taking time to digest it, taking time to internalize the reality of God's glory that he reveals to us through his word, he reveals to us as he speaks to us through our conscience, taking time to assimilate it, apply it to every aspect of our lives. And then it's not only about accessing and assimilating, but it's also about administering the glory of God. That word administer means to serve, to attend, to wait upon. So the privilege of God's glory that God invests in us, it's an investment that God wants us to use to bless other individuals, to wait upon other individuals, to serve other individuals. Salvation is God's means, I believe, of re-entrusting us with his glory. Initially, when God created us, we were covered with his glory, but something happened in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell prey to the enemy what happened is that they forfeited the glory of God. Therefore, they recognized that they were naked. Salvation is God's means of re-entrusting us with his glory. In Genesis 1, after God had completed his work of creation, he proclaimed that it was all good because it was all covered with his glory. God's glory has a way of making everything beautiful, amen? God's glory has a way of making the mundane spectacular. God's glory has a way of making the broken beautiful. God's glory has a way of making the repulsive attractive. That's how powerful God's glory is. Now, God does not leave the specifics of that transformation shrouded in existential ambiguity and subjected to human speculation. No, God in his word shows us exactly how we become transformed into attractive Christians. Now, the truth of the matter is that I shouldn't even have to use the term attractive before Christian because an unattractive Christian literally is an oxymoron. Are we together? But Christianity has not done a good job at representing Christ. When you think about the Crusades, it wasn't a good job at representing Christ. When you think about the reality of our, our, our residential schools right here in Canada, Christianity hasn't done a good job at representing Christ. So because of what we have done to Christianity, now we have to consider how do we become attractive Christians. And the truth of the matter is that the Bible is replete with admonition and inspiration and, and, and instructions on how we can become attractive Christians. I believe that, that the first stage to becoming an attractive Christian is staying in the throne room. That's the first stage, staying in in the throne room. And as we turn to Colossians, we recognize right there in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, we encounter this first stage of becoming an attractive Christian. And it is what? Staying in the throne room. You can think about this stage as the conditioning stage. 
You see, it is in the throne room where God works on us. The throne room is the place where God's presence metaphorically resides. I say metaphorically resides because God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But in the Bible, the Bible uses what we call anthropomorphisms, which is human ideologies to depict divine realities. And so in the book of Revelation chapter chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, you encounter God in the throne room, seated on the throne, and God invites John the Revelator to enter into the throne room, thereby becoming transformed, transfigured. And so the first stage of becoming an attractive Christian is staying in the throne room. Let's read Colossians chapter 3 verse, verse 1. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, do what? Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And of course, if you read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, you'll understand that that speaks about the throne room. So God is saying, when he rescues us, from our brokenness, when he rescues us from our dysfunction, we need to be determined to and intentional about staying in his presence so that in his presence, he can transform us. In his presence, he can transfigure us, staying in the throne room. You see, in the throne room, there is power. In the throne room. In the throne room, there is provision in the throne room. What provision am I speaking about? If you read Revelation chapter 4, you will see the provision right there. The provision in Revelation chapter 4, you have the promises of God. You see God seated on the throne with the rainbow encircling him, representing his covenant promise. So in the throne room, there is provision. Not only are there the promises of God, but there is the peace of God. So in Revelation chapter 4, before the throne, there is a sea as clear as crystal representing peace and tranquility. So God gives us promises in the throne room. He gives us peace in the throne room. In the throne room, there's also the sevenfold spirit representing the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That means in the throne room, God gives us his anointing. In the throne room, there is also security and stability. So in the throne room, there is power. In the throne room, there is provision. And in the throne room, there is progress. That's why when Christ shows up in Revelation chapter 5 and he, he takes the book with the seven seals and he breaks the seven seals, that represents the progression of humanity from the cross of Christ until the second coming of Christ. So just recapping, in the throne room there is what? There is power. In the throne room there is what? Promise or, or provision. In the throne room there is progress. This reality is the secret to spiritual victory, vitality, and velocity, staying in the throne room. Now, this is the key to persevering or to preserving spiritual power, staying in the throne room, is the key to preserving purpose and the key to preserving progress. You see, the devil will try to shift you, try to shift your position from the throne room of God's power to the board room of people's politics. But God is saying to you, stay in the throne room. People may try to call you back to the mediocrity and dysfunction of your past, asking you if you think you are too good for them. But God is saying to you, stay in the throne room for this is the process of being progressively transformed into an attractive Christian where you stay in the throne room that's God's process of transforming our hearts transforming our lives transforming our realities now understand this this process of being transformed into a progressive Christian 
begins with one word, and that one word is submission. What's the one word? Submission. You see, it's one thing to be in the throne room. It's one thing to be in the presence of God. But it's another thing to submit to the presence of God. You see, it is in the throne room that God exposes us to his glory. It is in the throne room that God transforms us by his word. It is in the throne room that God breaks the seals and releases us into our divine destiny. And so it may get lonely at times on this earth, but God is saying to you, stay in the throne room. You may feel like giving up at times on this earth, but God is saying to you, stay in the throne room. Keep your minds in the throne room. Keep your hearts in the throne room. Don't allow your lives to become inundated by what CNN and BBC and CBS throws at you, stay in the throne room. The progress may seem slow at times, but God is saying to you, stay in the throne room. Once you fulfill that first requirement of staying in the throne room, God will take you to the second stage and to the third stage of his purpose of transforming you into an attractive Christian. And the second stage is, Learning what really matters. When you take time to spend in the presence of God, in the throne room of God, guess what? Your perspective changes. And you begin to learn. You begin to recognize what really matters in life. Learning what really matters is the transformation stage. Learn what really matters. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul says, in this new life, it does not matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. He says what? Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. What is Paul saying here? He's saying what really matters is not our nationality. Now, I know some of you are proud based on where you've come from, but guess what? That means nothing to Christ. God doesn't care whether you are Trinidadian or whether you are Jamaican or whether you are Nigerian or Ghanaian or whether you are Canadian or American. That doesn't mean anything to Christ. So what really matters is not your nationality. What really matters is not even your theology, Lord have mercy. That is your view of who God is. That doesn't even really matter. What really matters is not your philosophy or your social status. Paul is saying what really matters is our submission to Christ. Our submission to Christ. Now, now, now. We need to understand who Christ is. There are many individuals who believe that Christ is the last name of Jesus. But get this, Christ isn't Jesus' surname. Christ is the title which represents the anointed one who imparts his anointing. So staying submitted to Christ, being submitted to Christ means surrendering, giving yourself fully up to the anointing and to the transforming power and glory of God. Now I said, I said, I said, I said, I said that um, what really matters isn't your nationality and you said amen. I said what really matters isn't your theology and many of you were quiet. What really matters isn't your philosophy, you said amen. Or your social status, you said amen. Now, let me break it down for you. It's, it's, it's possible, it's possible to be submitted to your theology but not be submitted to Christ. It's possible to believe in your belief about God and have no relationship with God. So if you believe merely in your belief about God, that means you have created your own idol which is the fabrication of your own imagination. It is possible to be submitted to your theology, but not submitted to Christ. 
It is possible to be submitted to your religiosity, but not be submitted to Christ. It's possible to be submitted to your generosity, but not be submitted to Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. All these other things are important, but only in a secondary sense. What really matters is our submission to Jesus Christ. Now, since that is so important, the question is asked, what does it mean to be submitted to Christ? Submission to Christ, all you need to know are two things, knowing and becoming. It's as simple as that. Sometimes religions make this whole notion about being devoted to God too complicated. To be submitted to Christ, all you need to focus on is knowing and what? Becoming. Knowing what? Knowing what? Knowing the love of Christ. And becoming what? Can anybody make a wild guess? Becoming what? That's right. Becoming the same thing. Becoming what you're knowing. So being submitted to Christ means knowing the love of Christ. And it means becoming the love of Christ. That's as simple as it is. It's all about love because God is love. Knowing firsthand the love of Christ and becoming the love of Christ. Get this, knowing by itself is not enough. And I'm going to show you something that Jesus Christ said that will blow your mind. Many of us know, uh, many of us know John chapter 8 verse 32 where Christ says, And you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. But guess what? There is a verse that comes before John 8 32. And it's John 8, 31. Here's what Christ says. Christ says in John 8, 31 and 32, he says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. In other words, if you stay in the throne room, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. So if knowing was enough, all Christ would have said, you shall know the truth. But guess what? If knowing the truth doesn't enable you and empower you to become set free from your limiting beliefs, from your dysfunctional mindset, guess what? The truth you know means nothing. Are we together? It's all in vain. And so the question is, are you progressively becoming what you are knowing? It's a question we each have to ask ourselves. Am I progressively becoming what I am knowing? And that's the point that Paul actually wants to make in Colossians 3 in verse 10 where he says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and what? And become like him. Knowing about God is not enough. If it were enough, Satan would be in a good place right now. But Satan, all the knowledge he has about God, Satan is not becoming more like God every single day. And I wonder to myself, if as a Christian, I have my membership in a particular Christian church, and all I am doing is knowing about God, but when I go to work on a Monday, my colleagues at work don't find that I'm a better person because I went to church on the weekend, my question is, am I different from Satan? Knowing and Becoming. Quickly, quickly, let's, let's move on to the third stage. We're almost out of time. The third stage, third stage. Becoming an attractive Christian. The first stage is staying in the throne room, and that's the conditioning stage. The second stage is learning what really matters, and that's the transformation stage. The third stage is manifesting the glory of God, and that is the representation stage. This is where you are completely sold out 
Hallelujah. You no longer represent yourself. You no longer abide under the management of yourself. You are sold out. You are under new management. You've got a new wardrobe. You've got a new attitude. You've got a new reservoir. As a matter of fact, if you read, I'm not just pulling words out of my head. If you read on in um, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, you'll realize, you'll realize that um, when you remain in the throne room of God, you actually get a new wardrobe. Check it out in your own Bible this time. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Check out your new wardrobe. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with what? Tender-hearted mercy. Your new wardrobe. You are now clothed with mercy. When you are clothed with mercy, when people get you on your last nerve, guess what they get? Mercy. Because even your last nerve is under the submission of mercy. He says that you are clothed with um, kindness. You are clothed with humility. You are clothed with gentleness and patience. You have a new wardrobe. But it's not only about how you look on the outside. Paul says you have a new attitude in Colossians 3 verses 13 to 15. And check out what your new attitude looks like in Colossians 3 13 to 15. He says make allowance for each other's faults. Lord have mercy. That, that alone is so powerful to me. Make allowance for people's faults. That means while I'm getting ready in the morning to go to work. While I'm getting ready, I need to make allowance for people who do crazy things to me. Now, the kind of allowance that God is saying you need to make allowance for is not how you would get back at them. It's not how you would cuss them off, but how you would show them what you are clothed with. That is, you will show them that you are clothed with tender-hearted mercy. You are clothed with kindness. You are clothed with humility. That means if you open the door for them and they just walk through as if you are their servants, guess what? You open the next door for them. The truth of the matter is that we are wasting our times coming here if we aren't serious about becoming like Jesus. We're wasting our times. Might as well close on the church and just go wherever you want to go. But he's saying you have a new attitude. Colossians chapter, chapter 3, 13 to 15. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Lord have mercy. New attitude. Many Christians practice selective forgiveness. Selective forgiveness is when you... is or based on what your relationship with the person is on base or based on what the person has demonstrated to you that's selective forgiveness but Paul is saying the new attitude God has given to you he's saying you need to forgive anyone who offends you remember that Jesus himself forgave you so you must forgive others he says in verse 15 and let the peace that comes from Christ rule where rule in your hearts. That means your new attitude is one of peace. Have you ever encountered a cantankerous Christian? Have you ever encountered an argumentative Christian? Have you ever encountered a Christian who specializes in finding a problem for every solution? God is saying, as a Christian, you ought to be clothed with peace, you have a new attitude of peace, of peace, of peace. And he says, and always be thankful. Have an attitude of gratitude. You know, 
As much as I don't know what each of your situations are or circumstances are, I can guarantee you that every single one of you in this place has at least one thing to be thankful for. I can tell you what it is. It's the breath of life. It's the ability to be here today. It's the ability to be in a place and a space where you can become exposed to the word of God. You can have your mind transformed by the renewing power of God's word. Every single one of us has at least one thing to be thankful for. And I've come to realize in life, it is a psychological fact that whatever you focus on magnifies. So if you focus on everything that's going wrong in your life, guess what you're going to have more of? If you focus on what's right in your life, guess what you're going to have more of? A new attitude. So, so you know, so, so he says that you're under new management. So you have a new wardrobe, you have a new attitude, and get this, he says you have a new reservoir. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, Let the message about Christ in all its fullness fill your life. Your new reservoir is the fact that you are now filled with the fullness of God. My friends, get this, get this, get this. The quality of your life will always be proportional to the source you are drawing from. Do you believe that? The quality of your life will always be proportional to the source you are drawing from. And so my question to you today is, what are you drawing from? Many years ago when I was in high school, I remember I was in a Bible class. I went to a Christian high school. I was in a Bible class and we were having a sanctified, spiritual discussion, out of the blue, one student got another student annoyed, and that student in Bible class cursed that other student out, just by impulse. Now, now, you know, I grew up in a culture where you don't curse. As a matter of fact, as a little boy, when I grew up in the Caribbean, the police would actually arrest you if you were cursing on the, on the streets. So you can imagine when I came back to Canada and I'm hearing things and nobody's getting arrested, <laughs> right? But um, this kid literally said some very profane words in Bible class. And when he recognized what he said, he said, oh, sorry, miss, it just came out. I'll never forget what the Bible teacher said. She said, it could never have come out if it wasn't already inside. Are we together? When people aggravate you, when people torment you, when people persecute you, the only thing they get is what you have to offer. So what are you carrying inside of you? Your mind is your source. And if you allow God to transform your mind, you will have a renewed source. A renewed source is a resource. And you will become an attractive Christian. Today, my friends, I want to make an appeal as we close. I want to make an appeal as we close. And there's a threefold appeal. A threefold appeal. I want to make an appeal for those who have misrepresented Christ, including myself. Many of us have been Christians for years, but we have misrepresented Christ. We have been the most unloving, the most unforgiving, the most vindictive people. And so there's an appeal to repentance. God is calling us to turn away from ourselves, to turn away from our bitterness, to turn away from the animosity, to turn away from the hatred. I'm also going to make an appeal as well for those who want to become better representatives of Christ. That is, even as you look at your walk with God, 
Yes, you and God are tight, but you recognize that there is still room for improvement. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 verse 18, the path of the just is like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter onto the perfect day. So with Christ, it's about constant progress. So I want to appeal to those who want to become better representatives of Christ. And also in that group, I want to call out to those who want to get to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Amen? So if you are part of any one of these categories, I want to invite you right where you are to please come down to the altar. Come down to the altar as we have a special prayer of dedication, a special prayer of rededication, a special prayer of surrender. I want to become an attractive Christian. I want to daily come to know the love of Christ more and become the love of Christ more. If there's anyone here today, and that is your prayer, that's your heart desire, join me here. We want to pray together. We want to claim the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As we come down, as we come down, my friends, we are taking this very seriously. We are taking this very seriously. We want to take time to pray for you. We want to take time to connect with you. Um, I decided a few weeks ago that I'm going to start an online Zoom baptism class. That means you can stay right in your homes, and I can join you virtually in your homes and go for the Word of God with you. So I have a card here that I want you to fill out. We're going to pass these cards out to every single one of you, and I want you, you're going to get a card, you're going to get a pencil, and I want you to fill out this card really quickly. It's called your CTW Commitment Card. CTW is Christ the Way. And there's a text here in John 13 verse 17 says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. On this card, there are four options. The first option, I want to become a member of CTW Church. That is, you've been coming here for a while and you want to be a part of what God is doing here. You want to use your talents, your gifts, your, and your abilities to serve the cause of God here. Just check this out, and we will ensure that we go through the process in having you as one of our members here. The second one is, I desire to surrender my life to God through baptism. You've heard the word of God spoken to you over and over again, and you felt the Spirit tugging at your heart, and you want to surrender everything to Christ through baptism. Check out this box, and we'll help prepare you for that. The third box is, I want to recommit my life to God. That is, you may have once had a deep, progressive, transformative walk with God, but you've fallen by the wayside and you want to get back on track. Tick off that box. And the fourth one, which I told you about, I would like to enroll in Pastor Natufi's online baptism class. That's your heart desire. Check it out. I'm going to contact you right away this week and we're going to get going. Amen? We're going to get going. We are going to use Zoom as a means of connecting together in the Word of God. Make sure you write your name, your full name, and your phone number so I can call you this week and we can follow through. Amen? Let us, let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much, dear God, for your Word today. As we have studied your Word in Colossians 3, dear Father, our hearts, dear God, have been touched. We have been pricked in our hearts. We've been convicted, Father by your word. Dear God, we want to be attractive Christians. We realize, dear God, historically, the church has misrepresented you. And we have not been as loving as we should be. We have not been as gracious as we should be. We have not been as forgiving as we should be. We have not been as merciful and as gentle and as humble and as patient as we should be, Father. Forgive us for such a gross misrepresentation. Forgive us, dear Father, for calling ourselves Christians while acting contrary. Father, forgive us. Rescue us from us. We realize, dear God, that the quality of our lives will always be proportional to the source we are drawing from. 
So renew our source, dear Father. Rescue our source from our evil desires, our evil proclivities, Father, and fill us with your anointing, fill us with your power, fill us with your glory. Transform us so that our lives can radiate with your love, your power, and your glory. Father, thank you, dear God, for this time we've had in your presence. And may you continue, dear God, to draw us deeper into the throne room Day by day we pray in Christ's name. Amen. My friends, please come quickly and just rest your cards on, on here. Leave your cards here. And once you fill them out, so we can connect with you this week. God bless you. We're going to um, call upon um, Brother Randall to lead us in our closing song. And um, I will connect with you this week, every single one of you. So when you see any number coming into your phone, that ends with seven, 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 three sevens. That's me. Amen. God bless you. I want to invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, Live Out That Life Within Me, O Jesus, King of Kings. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. Be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. Live out thy Things have thy way, either transparent thy glory to display. The temple has been yielded and purified of sin. Let thy Shekinah glory now shine forth from within. And all the earth keeps silence, the Thy silent, gentle servant moved only as by thee. Its members every moment held subject to thy call, ready to have thee use them or not be used at all. Held without restless longing, or strain, or stress, or fret, or chafings at thy dealings, or thoughts of vain regret. But restful, calm, and pliant, from bend and bias free, Awaiting thy decision when thou hast need of me. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. Be thou the glorious answer to all my questions. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be merciful unto you. May God lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you joy, give you glory, give you his anointing in your hearts, in your homes, and wherever you may go, both now and forevermore we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. We want to thank our online audience for joining us in worship today. God bless you. We are going to be back here again next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, 12 noon Eastern Time. Join us once again next Sabbath. For those of you who are here, we're going to break for a short 10-minute break, and we are going to reconvene here about quarter to quarter to 12, 20 to 12, for our adult Bible class. 
Those of you who want to be in the pastor's new believers class is going to be in the boardroom and for the children in the regular meeting places along the hallway. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.